All right, guys, let's get on to this. Um, this is basically the chronological order of which um, the uh, Antichrist actions occur. Uh, the last one was the second campaign against the South. One prior was the first campaign. This will be the end result of those campaigns, um, the apparent assassination and resuscitation of Antichrist. Again, coming tribulation series, ichthus.com, uh, coming tribulation series part 3b. Uh, this is Roman numeral 7, the apparent assassination and resuscitation of Antichrist. I'm going to read uh, Daniel 1130b. Then he will be stricken as if dead, but he will revive. Therefore he will be enraged at the Holy Covenant, so that on his return to Israel from the far south, he will take action against it. In other words, he will eliminate Moses and Elijah and end the sacrifices in the temple. Immediately upon the heels of his dramatic victory over the south, the beast will be the object of an attempted assassination plot. Uh... The event that gives him the fatal wound that is nevertheless, or nonetheless rather, miraculously healed. Uh, Revelation 13, 13. The key word here, the key word in the half verse above is the Hebrew form nikal. I think, uh, nika, I think I got that. Um, while there exists a variety of opinions amongst, amongst lexicographers, or lexicographers rather, and commentators about this difficult form, we, what we must, what we have here is most likely the nifal, in other words, the passive, perfect, of the verb ka'al, meaning to strike, smite, or scourge. Hence the transliteration, he will be stricken. Time and space do not here permit a detailed explanation of ka'al, or nikal, or nifa, uh, yeah, nikal, or ka'al, ka'a, whatever it is. I'm sorry, guys, I'm terrible with uh, actual Hebrew. I never actually got, I, I know some Greek, I don't know Hebrew. It must suffice to remark that in his Hebrew lexicon, um, Genes, Ge, uh, Gesenius likewise derived this form from the original uh, ha and that he and other commentators, notably uh, Zokler and T. Lewis in the Lang, Lang, Lang series, L-A-N-G-E series, also find the nifal of this verb at Job 38 in the form of uh, another variation, but driven and scourged from the land. Uh, Jesenius understands the dagesh forte as euphonic. If you guys want to look into that, that's pretty deep stuff, but the, the, the gist of it is, well, I'm going to read it. Translations which take this verb as being used here in strictly an emotional state, understanding it to mean that Antichrist will be disheartened but not physically injured, do so without any firm evidence. And you guys have seen this mis misunderstanding. Uh, it's an actual wound. Doesn't necessarily mean that he is resuscitated or actually brought back to life, though. The two passages often adduce as, adduced as parallels, namely Psalm 109.16 and Ezekiel 13.22, both contain the delimiting word heart, which specifies the place of... of place affected or stricken and thus the motive the move thus move the application of the blow from the physical to the emotional realm no similar delineate delineation word is to be found in daniel eleven thirty. therefore given that the meaning of the near identical root likewise means literally to strike or smite and given the well-known hebrew phenomenon of related roots often bearing identical meanings the preponderance of evidence points in the direction of Antichrist being stricken in a quite literal sense, as opposed to suffering a mere psychological attack. So he's not going to like lose his mind randomly, although his mind's already gone. The wounding and seemingly miraculous recovery of Antichrist described in Daniel 11.30 is thus the Old Testament parallel for the similar information given in Revelation chapter 13 and 17. They are identical. The Bible absolutely debunks the Bible. Excuse me. While we continue our method of covering these verses seriatim in their proper places, in accordance with the general chronology progressed of the book of Revelation that we have noted before, it will be of use here to consider the four pertinent passages of Scripture here. Revelation 13, 3a. And one of its, in other words, the beast's heads, looked as if it had been stricken unto death, and yet its mortal wound had been healed. Uh, Revelation 13, 12. And he, the beast's false prophet, will act with all the authority of the first beef, beast, while in his presence, and he will make the world and all its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Revelation thirteen fourteen, and he, the beast false prophet, will deceive those who dwell upon the earth on account of the miracles, literally the signs, which have been given him to him to perform in the presence of the beast, while commanding the inhabitants of the earth to make an image of the beast, that is, of him who received the deadly stroke of the sword and yet came back to life. Revelation 17, 8. The beast which you saw was, existed, and is not, came to not exist. That's the Greek direct translation into English. And is going to rise from the abyss. In other words, the revival of Rome on the one hand, and the apparent resuscitation of Antichrist on the other, and is going to its destruction. And the inhabitants of the earth, 
Those whose names have not remained written in the book of life remain, guys. No one saved, always saved. You must remain by choice. Where they were written from the beginning of the world, world will be will be in awe when they see the beast because he was existed and is not came to not exist and will again be present on the scene. Seem to return to life in a case of antichrist and be reestablished in respect to the empire. Whatever one makes of these passages, we can certainly say with authority that the Antichrist is most certainly not being resurrected here, as our Lord currently possesses an eternal body, and no one else will do so until the resurrection of his church at his return, at which point the beast will be deposed of into the lake of fire, Revelation 19.20. The question of resuscitation is a more difficult one. On the one hand, it is impossible that the devil would be able to engineer even the temporary return to life of his son, that is, a true resuscitation without divine permission for something so entirely unprecedented. In other words, the revival of life to death of an arch enemy of God and his people, and of such cons consent, we have no specific indication from Scripture. It's looking like it's going to be a fake. It's Antichrist. It's Satan. Of course, it's a fake. On the other hand, the four passages of Revelation from Revelation quoted above do suggest at the very least a physical revival, which means he might physically die and then come back. But we see that happen even now, which will be extraordinary in the extreme, probably because he'll be severely hindered. But technology has come to a place where some of this stuff might happen that is capable that we're not aware of and may not be made aware of specifically so this sort of thing can happen with the final passage revelation 17 8 pr presenting the most difficult case to explain away for even though that passage has its primary application to revive rome applying to the beast by extension as opposed to revelation 13 where this relationship of primary and secondary application is reversed what is true of one should also be true of the other. And the words was existed and is not came to not exist and will again be present on the scene are most emphatic and hard to take in any other way than a literal return from the dead. That is the definite departure and return of the spirit. Whether this assassination attempt results in Antichrist's actual death or, alternatively, a near-death experience so dramatic and traumatic that it will be, be nearly indistinguishable from actual death and resuscitation, it is clear from the reaction of, this, of the general public to the beast's recovery from this mortal wound that the genuineness of his death and the miraculous nature of his return to life will be taken as true and factual by the unbelieving world. The amazement and resultant worship of the world, for example, in, in Revelation 13, 3b through 4. It is also relatively easy to see how trauma unquestionably fatal is in the case of any other normal human being might not necessarily be so for the beast. For he will not be fully human after all. The angelic paternity of Antichrist will doubtless give him the physical resiliency to endure wounds to which any mere man would certainly succumb. We know from our previous study of the Nephilim, which I may go over here pretty quick, that prodigious physical attributes are the norm for such creatures, and it is probably that their ability to tolerate conditions which would kill normal human beings is at least part of the reason why God caused the Great Flood to cover the earth to such a depth and for so long. So it is certainly possible that while the world to the world Antichrist may appear to have received the an unavoidably fatal wound injury, uh, and may seem to have been stricken unto death, this wound, mortal in every other way, may not be near fatal in the case, may only be near fatal in the case. From the following context of the passage in both Daniel and Revelation, there is no evidence that the beast will suffer any chronic after effects of this wounding, beyond the permanent scar visible upon his head, left by the blow from the sword which strikes him. Quite the contrary, rather than a setback, this incident will actually be a boon to the beast, for it will do much to further the idea that he really is the true Christ, having thus risen from the dead in such a seemingly irrefutable way. It is therefore no accident that it will be directly in the wake of this incident that Antichrist's new religion will be transformed into outright devil worship and swiftly come to dominate the world. Revelation 13, 3 through 17. Revelation 13, 3 through 17. Unbelievers all over the earth will take this res resurrection to be genuine and to be legitimate proof of the beast status of the Messiah, as the Messiah rather. However, believers who know their God and continue to hold firm to the testimony of Jesus will remember our Lord warning to beware of all such fa false signs, no matter how persuasive, instead on their own resurrection at the return of our resurrected Lord. Matthew 24, 23 through 28. At that time, if someone says to you, look, as, and they will tell you, as they will tell you then, Christ is here, or is he, here he is, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and will perform great miracles, literally signs, and wonders sufficient to deceive even the elect if that were possible. Look, as I am telling you now, I have told you ahead of time, so, so if they say to you at all, look, he is in the desert, do not go out there, or look, he is in the inner rooms, hiding in the city, do not believe it. For as lightning, though it comes from the east, is visible all the way to the west, this is just how the, sun, the return of the Son of Man, in other words, the second advent, will be. For whether the body 
where for wherever the body i.e the lord there the angels will gather uh believers rising and resurrection in other words the eagles will gather apologies beyond the details from daniel and revelation provided above we can say a few things further about this critical event having conquered the king of the south the beast will be at the height of his power with no possible combination of the remaining independent powers on earth capable of resisting the combined power of babylon revived rome and the now occupied and cooperating territories of the southern kingdom at this point with the world for all practical practical purposes lying prostrate at his feet antichrist's plan soon to be successfully carried out will be to move his headquarters to Jerusalem, intending to rule the world from there as if he were God. See 2 Thessalonians 2.4. It should be observed in regard to this to his treatment of the Jews, moreover, that in addition to the measures against the covenant already taken at the conclusion of the first campaign, Daniel 11.28, the land of Israel will be, roughly, will be roughly handled during the second campaign, with the invading amphibious forces treating her and her population as anything but allies. In other words, in other words they will afflict Eber. Remember the verses from the last video. Numbers 24, 24, Isaiah 33, 1 through 8, especially uh, verse 8, and Lamentations 1, 2, chapter 10, 19, and 21. Those are all chapters. Chapter 1, verse 2, and then chapter 10, 19, and 21. The beast's horrendous plans to complete, completely annul his agreement with the state of Israel and to thoroughly abrogate the revival of the temple rite will doubtless be totally secret, even before the fact at least not to his inner circle, a group of which we may expect will contain representatives from Israel, one of the seven original kingdoms of revived Rome. It is more than likely, therefore, that the agents of this assassination attempt will be Jewish. This would seem to be the best explanation for the close connection given in Daniel 11.30 between the striking down of Antichrist and the fury released immediately thereafter against the legitimately revived worship of God in Jerusalem and those who are involved therein. Daniel 11.30b. Then he will be stricken as if dead, but will revive. Therefore, he will be enraged at the Holy Covenant, so that on his return to Israel from the far south, he will take action against it, eliminating Moses, Moses and Elijah and ending the sacrifices. It should not escape our attention here that this rage and retaliation are an indication of Antichrist's core anti-Semitism, for it will be technically misplaced. For it, though, for it will be technically misplaced. Those who are truly following Jesus Christ in response to the ministry of Moses and Elijah and the 144,000 will be focused upon divine will be focused upon divine solutions and will certainly not be misled into thinking that any act of violence of this sort no matter how apparently justifiable will in any way ward off the great tribulation to come it's not going to stop it At this time in Israel there will essentially be three major factions into which the body politic is split 1 dedicated followers of antichrist 2 dedicated followers of our lord 3 Patriots or zealots, most of whom were ardent supporters of the beast when he appeared to be the only worldly hope of help against the Mahdi and his hordes. That, by the way, reminds me a lot of somebody like Trump. It's not that I'm against the economy that he had and, 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 and certain things, but morally corrupt and absolutely, essentially, a pre-version of Antichrist. Sorry, guys. As the tribulation progresses, we can expect more and more of the first group to migrate into the third. See Zechariah 12, 3 through 8 with Zechariah 12:10. Those who truly know God, however, will flee into the wilderness in accordance with the commands of our Lord just as soon as Antichrist sets up the abomination of desolation as a putative part of his reaction to this assault on his person, though his plan all along has been to take this action. Be certain of it. In addition to supporting his argument to be the true Messiah, therefore, this assassination attempt will also supply the beast with a certain measure of justification for the harsh treatment of Israel to follow, and specifically for his war against Moses and Elijah and the subsequent termination of the, revival, the revived temple worship, an action that will itself enjoy a measure of worldwide popularity because of their direction of the trumpet judgments. Revelation 11, 7 through 13. For Antichrist will opportunistically, though falsely, lay this deed at their feet. Finally, it is likely that the assassination attempt will take place while Antichrist is involved in directing the, pl directing the plundering, plundering of Egypt, the heartland of the Mahdi's power, uh, Ezekiel 39, also Daniel 11:30a. For he is said to return to Israel in the event, in the event, in order to vent his anger against the covenant. Um, yeah, I, I don't see any other way to break this down. This is again the most reasonable, most logical, most excellent. Uh, description of Antichrist and his actions uh, as his putative resuscitation would, would uh, it's the best description and the best com combined uh, uh, layout I've ever seen. And this, this again, makes the most sense. I hope you guys found this useful. I'm trying to keep this a little bit shorter because I know these are long and it's difficult to just sit there and, and listen. And I, I hope you guys are, are, are able to get stuff done, but also able to suck this up because this is essentially um, 
This is highly misunderstood. There's a lot of nonsense. A lot of liberal scholars have changed these words around based upon feelings, not on facts, and definitely not taking other scripture into consideration the way the doctor has here. Um, I really appreciate you guys watching. Subscribe, share the video. You all know it's suppressed. You can't even search for it. Um, but this is, this is great information. We need to know it so that when the time comes, there's no question as to what's going on. Um, and also, I'd like to make note that Jesus Christ comes back with a perfect body. And yes, he does have the scars on his hands and feet as a memorial to his sacrifice to us. Um, but he comes back in a refulgently awesome body. He doesn't just come back in a normal human looking body with a giant scar on his face the way Antichrist does. So the obviousness of his evil and the obviousness of the most likely fake nature of his quote unquote resurrection resuscitation will be obvious to those of us paying attention. And it will be really sad to see people accept a, a man with a giant scar on his face as somehow the son of God, which is ridiculous. I love you guys. Bless you. Uh, the next video is going to be about the abomination, abomination of desolation and the session of Antichrist as he sits in the temple claiming to be God while uh, coming after us. Thank you guys. We'll talk to you soon.